Hello everybody, Bentley Compost Guy Christy here again. In this video, I want to show you how I set up a super simple, breathable bucket worm composting bin. Right off the bat, I want to make it clear that I would normally never recommend using a bucket for a worm bin. Buckets have very little exposed surface area, so there's a lot less air that can get down into the composting zone. They also retain moisture really, really well. And the combination of these two factors can lead to swampy anaerobic conditions, especially if you do use a plastic lid. Not at all what we're after. Remember, vermicomposting is an aerobic process. It requires a decent amount of oxygen in order to operate effectively. As far as simple, cheap, do-it-yourselfer types of systems go, something like a typical plastic tub, such as a Rubbermaid Roughneck Tote, is a much better choice most of the time since the surface area exposed to airflow is going to be a lot greater but there is a way to make a bucket work the key is to add specialized air vents and a breathable lid now before i show you how i set up my bucket bin i want to give a big shout out to mark payne of eve growing a friend of mine told me about a video that Mark had made featuring these vents, and that's where I learned the method. The video in question is called Vernmenting Bin Method, and he starts talking about the vents around the 647 mark. I'll make sure to include a link down in the description or in the blog post, depending on where you're viewing this. Just generally be sure to check out Mark's YouTube channel. Again, Eve Growing. Lots and lots of interesting videos there. And his vermenting method is really, really quite fascinating on its own. All right, well, that out of the way, it's time to start looking at how I set up this breathable bucket bin. Here's an image of some of my main supplies. I use three plastic bottles for my vents, a PVC cutter, to cut the bottles as needed, a five gallon plastic bucket, fabric from an old work shirt. As you'll see a little bit later on, I did end up using something else for the vents, but this work shirt fabric was great for the lid. And an elastic to secure that lid in place. Of course, you're gonna need some sort of drill and a one inch hole cutting bit is perfect. I also recommend some sort of box cutter if you need to help with the holes. They're going to be a little bit rough and cleaning them up with a box cutter can work quite well. So the first thing that I did was make my vents. This involved cutting off the very top of the lid and then cutting the neck of the bottle. I recommend doing it in this order since the bottle itself is going to give you something to hold on to while you cut the lid. Obviously, you want to get as close to the top as you possibly can. It does need to be open, but you also want to make sure that you have enough of the lid left to thread down and be able to tighten up these vents. It's going to look something like this. As you can see, it doesn't need to be perfect as long as what's left of the lid can still screw down and tighten against the bucket. Next, you're going to cut off the neck of the bottle just behind the collar. And once you have your vents ready to go, you can start to drill your holes. <laughs> like I said, you don't need to be perfect. My first hole was absolutely brutal. But the good news is it does seem to get better with some practice. My later holes were much better. And they, again, that box cutter certainly helped. All right, well, now it's time to start popping in those vents. I did need to clean up my holes a bit with the box cutter. So you may need to do the same just to make sure that it's going to go through. You want to make sure that you're pushing them through from the inside of the bucket. We want the caps on the outside. And speaking of the caps, hopefully it's a given that you're pushing them through before you attach the cap. Remember, we still have to add that fabric and the cap itself is going to make those vents a bit thicker. So it'd be harder to get them through the hole. Now, one thing Mark didn't mention in his video was the little ring part. I did end up leaving this in place for one of my vents and it's probably going to be okay. 
For another one, I thought that an elastic wrapped around it might serve as sort of a seal. It might be better than, than the ring, so I did that. The third one I actually put in without anything, and it seemed to end up nice and snug against the inner wall. And you can see how the collar part is fairly important just because it helps to close in, I guess, any of the imperfection of that hole that you cut. All in all, as you might guess, I am leaning more towards the flat approach. Like I said, very, very snug and seems to tighten it up nicely. But at the end of the day, I think all these vents are going to be okay. As you'll see, that fabric is going to be pushed up right up against the wall on the other side, which is going to help as well. Now, speaking of which, once the vents were pushed through, it was time to add the fabric. Like I said, I originally attempted to work with an old work shirt. But I realized that it was too thick and that the texture wasn't quite right for tightening the lids down properly. I happened to find an old scarf or a hanky. I don't even really know what it was. It was thinner and had a smoother texture. And it worked like a charm. Much better than the other material. Basically, you just place it over the hole and then screw down what's left of the lid. And tighten it as best you can against the side of the bucket. As touched on, the fabric should kind of push down in around the hole itself. So if you do have some gaps here and there, I think that's, that should do a good job of, of kind of sealing that up. There's plenty of options as far as fabric goes. And probably a good chance that you're going to have something already at home. Something like old sheer curtains or scarves or even nylon stockings. I would think that any of these would be fantastic. Thin and breathable is the key. At least partially synthetic should help as well just because that can extend the life of the material and it's likely going to have more of a slick texture that's going to help with that threading process. Once the cap is tightened against the bucket, you should have a nicely sealed hole. Now obviously if you want to trim things up, make it look a little neater, that's totally fine. I didn't worry too, too much about this. Now for this particular bucket, I decided on three vents. I would think that four would be even better and probably as few as two should still work. All right, so how did I set up this particular bin? First of all, I want to say that you shouldn't assume that you need to set yours up exactly the same way. I recommend focusing more on the key steps rather than on all the specifics. Something I do recommend for a first step is some form of false bottom. I use shredded cardboard, but something like shredded newsprint would also work well. It should be absorbent, carbon rich, and fairly bulky to support airflow down on the bottom there. I brought the level of my shredded cardboard up past the vents before adding a sort of floor of newsprint. <laughs> Funny as I didn't notice the headline <laughs> until later. These crazy Canadian student newspapers, I tell you. The key idea with the false bottom is that it's going to greatly help to support airflow from below and to soak up excess liquid that's going to be draining down. Gradually over time, it will of course settle and it's going to start to break down. That's totally fine. This is just a great way to support the process early on and to avoid some of those common hassles that you can encounter with enclosed plastic bins. On top of the newsprint, I added some chopped up mixed kitchen scraps. Normally, I would use a frozen then thawed material since it helps with the breakdown process and kills the tissues, you know, things like carrots and potatoes, things that can actually grow, as well as these potential fruit flags that can be found in some of the peelings. I didn't happen to have any of this in this particular case, so I just used regular scraps and that's totally fine but chopping them up is highly recommended. Next, I mixed in some living materials. Unfortunately, I've been having some issues with my camera. I did take a picture of the mixed material. It was mixed in with the food scraps, but it disappeared on me. Anyway, the material itself looked something like this. If you're not familiar with the concept of living material, be sure to check out my video on the topic. Basically, it's this dark, earthy smelling, fairly stabilized stuff that's going to be loaded with beneficial microbes. When you coat all the chopped up waste, it's going to greatly help to kickstart the breakdown process. 
and keep everything nice and warm friendly. Even a small amount, a handful or two, can make a big difference. Remember, you know, something like a teaspoon or a tablespoon of rich compost can have billions of microorganisms in it. Next, it was time to add the worms. I always prefer to add worm rich material from an active system rather than bulk worms. This is more of a natural strategy. The worms are going to come with a quality living habitat material that they're already familiar with. But if you do need to use bulk worms, if you're just starting out, whatever, that's totally fine. I would suggest something like a half pound of worms for a bucket system like this, sort of on the low side. And so maybe set up two of these buckets when you first get started. And instead of all this habitat material that comes with the worms, I would recommend instead using some moistened bedding material. Hopefully, if you do have access to living material, you can mix some of that with your bedding. But that's going to be your main habitat zone since the worms themselves aren't going to come with all that much. Now, in my case, technically, I didn't need to add the living material to the food because there was so much with the worms. But, you know, it never hurts okay, to mix that right in there. It's a slightly different living material anyway, and I'm certainly not going to regret that. Some of you may be familiar with my comfrey and cardboard experiment from earlier in the year. Unfortunately, life kind of got in the way of doing too much with that one, but it was very clear that these materials can make for a great worm food mix, and this is certainly not the last you're going to hear about that, even in this video, as you'll see a little bit later on. Now, as you can see in this bin, what was left there, very well processed, lots and lots of nice living material what you can't see is that there are also tons and tons of smaller red worms so we're going to have a nice population right out of the gates the material was a little bit on the wet side though so i decided to add a bit more shredded cardboard dry shredded cardboard part way up this just helps to freshen up the habitat a little bit as well just because again they've been sitting in this bin for a long time this is kind of old habitat material that they're living in next i added a layer of shredded newsprint in this particular case this was going to serve as a separator from my next layer of food and as i kind of hinted at a little bit earlier i actually decided in this case to add some more comfrey i chopped it up and mixed it with some more living material this way I kind of get to continue my experiment for a little while longer my window of opportunity for harvest and comfrey is narrowing quite a bit these days but I should at least be able to use it as a food for a, a little while and see how it works in this bucket system very very important to keep in mind that green waste like this can be a bit tricky to work with and if you're using a small indoor enclosed bin, I recommend only adding them if the system is very, very well ventilated. Ideally, if you have some living material that you can mix in as well. If you're just kind of getting started, you don't need to be messing around with green waste. These wastes like comfrey, grass clippings, various weeds, they have a low carbon to nitrogen ratio and they break down really, really easily, very often resulting in the release of ammonia gas. And ammonia is very deadly for worms, even in very small amounts. So you got to be a bit careful about that. Same with fresh manure, things like this. You know, sometimes it's better to use these in open outdoor systems instead. In this case, I put the material up at the top, mixed it with living material, and included that separation zone that I mentioned. And this is going to help things a lot. I don't foresee there being any issues that are going to happen as a result. Now, the last step I always recommend with home bins is adding a nice thick layer of dry bedding up top. This helps to balance the moisture and provides you with an ongoing supply of bedding that can be mixed in with food deposits over time. Once that was in place, it was time to put on my trusty fabric lid. Again, that thicker but still breathable fabric that I got from the old work shirt was perfect for this particular situation. Something like an old t-shirt or an old towel could work very well. Lots of different options. Now, I secured it with a big elastic. This was more of a convenience thing than anything. If you are concerned about flying pests, things like this, 
you might try something that's going to tighten down a bit more especially if you are planning to make this more of a set it and forget it type of bin i would think that there's various types of velcro tightening straps things like that that would tighten really nicely but at the same time be very easy to remove lots of different options i'm sure this particular bucket system is going to be sitting down in my basement and i'm definitely excited to see how things pan out with it one thing that i really really love about buckets is the fact that they take up so little space and they're very very easy to move around unlike some of these bigger home bins that you can work with my hunch is that with all that extra airflow from the vents and the lid this thing is going to work really really well and the worms are going to be healthy they're going to thrive and the system is going to thrive we're now kind of getting to the time of year where you don't have to worry so much about flying pests like your fruit flies, your fungus gnats, things like that. But it is still nice to have this extra layer of protection to kind of keep them out. I'm very eager to try out these vents in a variety of different systems as well. Some will be just purely bins for making various types of worm food mixes. Others, of course, for actual vermicomposting. I just need to track down a bunch more of these caps. I'll probably start raiding some recycling bins to get those. As far as this particular bucket goes, I will likely just leave it alone for the next week or two. There's lots of food in there right now. I will keep an eye on things and maybe start to add a bit of food. You know, probably in you know a couple weeks or so. And maybe, uh, like I said, I, I'd probably go with some comfrey before the end of the season and this generally get back into uh, typical kitchen scraps from there very very interested to see what happens and i'll be sure to keep everyone posted on that note it's time to sign off hope you found this video helpful don't hesitate to leave any questions or comments you have below and if you haven't already don't forget to subscribe definitely some more videos on the way thanks for watching and we'll talk again soon